Good morning, brothers and sisters. Today, we'll be taking a look at Killing Floor 2, the sequel to the original Killing Floor. As you all know by now, Killing Floor... Hold up. You never played Killing Floor 2. <laughs> but let me tell you all about it after a quick message from our sponsor, Obama. Sajja. He's more than just a terrorist. He is gay and lesbian. Very cool, Obama. Thanks. Killing Floor 2 is a first-person co-op horde survival bruh, shooter bruh. with a fairly simple yet satisfying gameplay loop of exploding heads, flying limbs, and mutant titties that is accompanied by a fine selection of heavy music. For the most part. There is one band in particular that sucks beyond belief and somehow they managed to get over 12 songs into the game. TRASH! But I digress. You choose one of four difficulties and three lengths and then start killing Zeds until you reach the boss. Between each wave you can buy ammo, armor, upgrades and weapons. With the in-match currency known as Dosh that is earned through killing and healing. The early waves will put you up against trash mobs such as the Claude and his brothers, small titty golf girlfriend, Crawler and Gorefast. As you climb in the waves, the difficulty will increase, and stronger mid-tier Zeds will start appearing, like the Husk, Siren, and Robots, because those totally belong in a zombie game. Yeah, what kind of brain that thought this is a good idea? Anyways, all of the mid-tiers come with their own unique set of attacks and threat levels, like the Sirens, who will destroy projectiles with their SJW screech. Lastly, there's the big boy Zeds that appear in later waves. The Scrake and Flash Pound need no introduction. When you hear a sound similar to this, just know they're coming for your ass. The Scrake comes with a chainsaw instead of an arm and is fairly calm and slow, but once dealt enough damage, he goes into permanent rage mode. In other words, the Flash Pound has two meat grinders for arms and a Fortnite juice pump on his chest that turns red when he is enraged. Flash Pound is raged at random, so killing them is top priority. If you're lucky enough, however, you might encounter four smaller Flash Pounds known as Quarter Pounds instead. If you manage to get through all that, here's a clap for you, young one. But it ain't over just yet. Each match ends with a boss fight, of which there are five types. The Patriarch, a massive unit with a minigun, a rocket launcher that shoots free rockets, and an extendable nipple that can pull you in closer for a bitch slap. Oh, and I almost forgot, this dude can turn sort of invisible. Fun stuff. Hans Volter, a naughty, nasty boy, that dual wields assault rifles, grabs you by your titties to heal himself between each phase, and as you might have guessed, yes, he does use gas grenades. King Flesh Pond, pretty much a regular Flesh Pond, just stronger in every way and has additional moves. The Abomination, literally just a bloat with destroyable armor and additional moves. And lastly, the Matriarch, also known as the pinnacle of originality. This could quite possibly be Tripwire at their peak performance, which is very unepic. She shoots out a shock beam that channels through fellow teammates, pounces when you're too close, has an extendable nipple like the Patriarch, and destroyable armor pieces like the Abomination. You might be thinking to yourself, Bruh, all you do is kill and buy, that's your hell aboard, and I'm going back to Fortnite Battle Royale Chapter 2. But wait bro, please. There are a few things you should know about the spice up the gameplay greatly. Those being perks, maps, and modes. Each Z has their own resistances and weaknesses to specific damage types, which is where perks come into play. There is one to fit every role and playstyle. Berserker is oriented around high damage with melee weapons and has high survivability. Support is oriented around high damage with shotguns and other weapons that use shells. Commando is oriented around high damage with assault rifles. SWAT is oriented around medium damage with SMGs. Medic is oriented around healing and low to mid damage with medic weapons. Demolitionist is oriented around high damage with EXPLOSIONS! Firebug is oriented around medium damage with pyrotechnical weapons. Sharpshooter is oriented around high damage with sniper-esque weapons. Gunslinger is the cowboy version of Sharpshooter, oriented around revolvers and western-style weapons. And lastly, there's Survivalist, another one of Tripwire's big brain energy ideas. Survivalist is supposed to be a jack of all trades, master of none, which sounds cool in theory if you want to have more flexibility with your playstyle. But there is an issue. There is a multi perk system in place for weapons. For example, the Spitfire, a revolver that shoots out fire projectiles, works with both Gunslinger and Firebug skills, ultimately rendering Survivalist an epic cringe post. Every level your perk bonuses will increase, and every 5 levels you can select one of two skills to suit your needs with the perk you're using. All level 25 skills are related to Z-Time, which is basically slow-mo, giving you a nice boost and advantage. Depending on team composition, this boost can be massive. As mentioned in the beginning, there are four difficulties. Normal and hard are for gaming journalists, suicidal and hell nerf are for real epic gamers, where Zs are STRONGER IN EVERY WAY. The higher difficulties are also where the Elite Z variants are common, such as Gorefiend, Elite Crawler that explodes into a gas cloud unless shot in the head, and Rioter that buffs nearby Zs, making them faster and stronger. There is an additional difficulty modifier in the game, which is based on the amount of players present in the match. 
more players equals more Zeds, which means one survivalist boy with antisocial tendencies could put a group in a rough spot if he doesn't pull his weight. COIN YOURSELVES, PECKERS! Killing Floor 2 offers some beautiful maps with their own unique vibe and memorable layout that you can just enjoy every time you're playing, like Airship, Outpost and Zed Landing, just to name a few. I say some because holy moly Obama ate my guacamole, a lot of the maps coming out recently are nothing short of reused acid garbage. It's gotten so bad that even some maps that were unique and special are just bland now because you can see the same exact aesthetic on other maps. At the time of recording, there are 29 maps. 13 of them are forgettable as f Of course this is very subjective, but I have not met a single person who thought Ashwood Asylum is anything other than It tries to emulate the vibe of the original Killing Floor 1 maps that offered a grim and eerie atmosphere, but completely misses the mark. On the bright side though, there are a lot of community made maps, some of which provide quality mayhem and goofy settings. The killing floor staple is survival, getting from the first wave to the boss wave, and comes in three different lengths, short, medium and long. It's pretty much the best experience you can get. Yes, hello, this is post edit me, here to talk for the rest of the video because my opinions have drastically changed towards the modes and the game as a whole while gathering footage. So uh, yeah, let's start with endless mode. It's pretty much as the name suggests, instead of ending on a boss fight, you get one every fifth wave, and can keep going for as long as you want. It gets boring fast, but if you want to mindlessly farm XP, it's there. Now objective mode. At first I thought, wow, this is scuffed, but not too bad. But after multiple more attempts on each map, my conclusion is that these 100% suck. You'll be going through the same objectives on each map, just in different order. There is no meaningful progression to it, nor is there any substantial story either. Whereas in Killing for One, you would start in an entrance to an area and finish at the heart of it, with a somewhat cohesive narrative guiding you through it. There is only one map that mimics that in this game, Steam Fortress. But it gets dragged down into the garbage category because you have to do the same objectives twice, each. Luckily enough, one of the objective mode maps didn't work for me, so I didn't have to suffer through it to gather footage. One of the main problems with Killing Floor 2 is that there is no real incentive to play. Sure, at first you can go for achievements, get every perk to level 25, maybe even prestige the perks to get skins. But other than that, there isn't much. This is where Trooper released one of their best ideas for the game, probably ever. Weekly Outbreak, a mode where there's a unique modifier that changes every week. Zeds that explode on kill, Zeds that shrink from being dealt damage, stuff like that. And upon completion you get a cool cosmetic for your weapon or character, which really gives you a reason to play the game at least once a week if you depleted every other source of content. But there's an issue here too. Tripwire have pretty much abandoned this mode completely. The same old 8 Outbreaks are on rotation for 3 years now, and there's no sign of reviving this mode. This is not the first time a mode has died in this game. Versus mode has been in this game since April of 2016, and it allowed players to play as the Zeds against other players, but there were numerous issues with balancing, and instead of polishing them out, Tripwire has abandoned the mode entirely. You might have noticed by now that Tripwire released shit just for the sake of releasing shit, whether it's weapons, maps, the seasonal events, or whatever else came and will come along the way. Every season, Tripwire released a seasonal event in Killing Floor 2 that comes with Zed reskins fitting for the season, new weapons, new map, and seasonal objectives to unlock a free skin. As of recent, however, Tripwire have decided to monetize weapons. Just today, ladies and gentlemen, you can buy a weapon for half the price of the game, a single weapon for $10. I'ma be real with you, Chief. I don't mind microtransactions when they're purely cosmetic, because fashion is the real endgame. But these paid weapons feel like Tripwire just want to suck money out of its player base, and they know some players will pay because they love this game and don't want to see it lose dev support. So how about you, Tripwire, make something worthy of paying 10 bucks for? Make a battle pass or a season pass? That way players have a reason to play the game, they will get some of the hundreds of skins you have bloating your store that most people don't even look at, and most importantly, players would feel the bang for buck. No one with a functioning brain is saying or is going to say that 10 bucks for a single weapon is worth it. Or how about you flesh out the world? Make proper objective mode maps that develop the Killing Floor world with interesting lore and not the garbage that is in the game right now. Killing Floor 2's primary selling point is the shooty shooty, yet somehow you think locking some shooty shooty behind a paywall will benefit the game? Bruh. But Sergio, free reskinned weapons with a different effect are still coming alongside the paid ones. Shut the fuck up, boomer. Surely there is a story or something to save this game from Tripwire's dick in the booty behavior, but there really isn't. There are some text blocks on each character and wiki page explaining the hows and whys, but that's about it. Most of the 
lore, justifying the addition of robots or any other retarded shit tripwire pull comes from their update blogs, rather than an experience you take part in. That's where I'll end my rant and move to the conclusion, because I could go on for days when it comes to tripwires and competence. I love the original Killing Floor, and I used to love Killing Floor too. I've met a lot of people that I still keep in touch with to this day from Killing Floor matches, but the people responsible for keeping the game alive and growing have seemingly no goals or aspirations for the game. Do you want to have a horror shooter with a memorable atmosphere like the original Killing Floor? Or do you want caught zombies but without the interesting story and far less impressive sci-fi bullshit? Being stuck in the middle will drive the game down, and judging by the direction of the game right now, Tripwire want to remain in the middle until the game is no longer profitable. As a whole, Tripwire be trippin'. This game is worth a try only if you have friends that play it religiously. Otherwise, just spend your money on something better. Giving this game a numerical rating that will remain relevant in the future is hard since Tripwire could easily make the game amazing or horrendous with one update. So I'ma settle on a 6, even though deep down in my soul, it's a 5. I would like to thank you very much for watching through this entire video, this is like way longer than I usually do on this channel, and a lot more uh, from, from the heart, you know, so, you know, I, anyway, uh, yeah, thank you, and if you enjoyed, please leave the button with the thumb on it, like, peace. Hey.